Depending on the complexity of the fiber optic network, the system design may be straightforward or highly complicated. Modern high-speed DWDM systems demand attention to numerous details such as chromatic and polarization mode dispersion, add drop facilities, and optical amplification. As the network becomes larger, these considerations become more numerous and more important, so the designer of large, high-performance networks can no longer rely on simple, pencil and paper methods to plan a stable and reliable network. For this reason, a number of specialized software packages have been developed to aid the designer in all aspects of optical network designs. The highly complex software features libraries of optical and electro-optical components, types of fiber and optical subsystems, allowing the designer to build and test a virtual network while working out potential problem areas before any real equipment is deployed. The parameters of each component, such as laser diodes, transmitters, or receivers, can be individually altered, allowing the designer to examine the effects of component aging or failure, as well as see how different classes of components may function in different scenarios. For each design, the software makes all relevant calculations including power and loss budgets, dispersion compensation, and provides valuable recommendations on network construction. The use of these software packages eliminates many of the common mistakes and pitfalls encountered when developing complex network designs. While system engineers work at high performance levels with complex test equipment, most users expect systems that can easily be installed into their networks. Designers of all fiber optic communication systems must employ basic design criteria. Of these, the most important is the system loss budget. The loss budget defines the amount of light that is required to operate a system to meet a level of performance for optimum signal quality. As you may have learned, there are many options available for today's users to choose from. The major elements are the type of source, detector, along with the wavelength, and the type of fiber to be used. Applications vary, however. Long-haul systems require lower fiber attenuation levels than premises, security, and industrial applications where distances are much shorter. Other designs, including wavelength division multiplexing or fiber to the home, may require higher power levels due to the inclusion of passive components, including optical splitters, multiplexers, and filters. In some cases, manufacturers of systems simplify this process to make systems easier for users and applications such as security, industrial controls, and premises wiring. These applications generally use much shorter spans than telephone, CATV, and utility communication networks, where distances can reach hundreds of kilometers. In these cases, the manufacturer may only provide the maximum distance and the total end-to-end -end attenuation measured in dB. The type of fiber, source, detectors, connector, and wavelength are generally specified and the user just has to match the distance, fiber type, and the maximum attenuation value specified. However, most fiber optic communication spans require more extensive evaluation, selection, and integration disciplines. These include the current operational data rate and the expected bandwidth requirements over the life of the installation. Physical plant considerations include distance, the number of connectors, splices, and other passive components. In addition, outside plant installations tend to be damaged or cut many times over their lifetime, so future restoration, aging losses, and end-of-life issues must be included when performing initial loss budgets. To build a loss budget, we must consider the distance transmitted and therefore the amount of signal attenuation to be expected from the type of fiber to be used. As all fibers have different attenuation levels based on the wavelength of the source used, we must have a basic understanding of loss per wavelength using different fiber types. For example, let's start by looking at a short distance system for typical local area network, storage area network, or simple point-to-point -point links including security and industrial control applications. In these cases, the distance will usually be less than a kilometer or two. Using legacy 62.5125 multimode fiber operating at 850 nanometers, the loss per kilometer is 3.5 dB. A typical LED has optical power levels of minus 20 dBm and a typical pin photo detector has a minimum level of minus 35 dBm. When we subtract the receiver level from the transmitted level, we see that we can have up to 15 dB of optical attenuation in the span. 
This is more than ideal in this case, as it would allow for future ads, moves, and changes. Assuming that each end of the span will include a fiber optic cross connect, the related connector losses as specified by the TIA EIA 568 standard of 0.75 dB each would add 1.5 dB of attenuation. Therefore, for a 1 km span, the fiber loss would be 3.5 dB plus 1.5 dB of loss for the connectors, giving us a total expected loss of 5 dB. This example is typical of many systems operating in the hundreds of megabits per second. Now, let's look at a system operating at 1 gigabit per second, with the possibility of migrating to 10 gigabits per second in the future. First, LED light sources are limited by their speed. Systems operating at gigabit data rates require a laser source regardless of the distance. In this case, we are going to use the same 1 km span, but will change the fiber to a laser optimized 5125 graded index fiber as specified by the TIA 492 specification. This fiber is designed for use with a Vixel light source operating at 850 nanometers. The expected attenuation now is 3 dB for the kilometer span and the number of connectors has been increased from 2 to 4 due to greater access for the higher speed building backbone. We now see that our fiber loss has decreased from 3.5 dB to 3 dB while our physical connection losses have doubled from 1.5 dB to 3 dB. Our total end-to-end not-to-exceed loss is now 6 dB. The typical output power coupled into a 5125 fiber using a Vixel is approximately minus 5 dBm. Using a low-cost pin photodiode, we can expect a receiver sensitivity of approximately minus 20 dBm, leaving an allowed path loss value of 15 dB. Again, our allowed loss is much greater than the physical plant losses, so our loss budget is acceptable. A point to consider is to always check the maximum amount of light that the photodiode can handle, known as the maximum input power. If the received light level is greater than this amount, then an optical attenuator may be required. Optical attenuators add attenuation to fibers and are normally located at cross-connect panels at the receiver ports. A second point is to check the reflection value specified for all fiber optic connectors. High reflection levels will result in increased bit errors from the transmitting laser. The next example will be the future migration to a 10 gigabit backbone. While we were able to use the laser optimized fiber for gigabit transmission over the 1 kilometer span, we now are confronted with the pervasive problem of modal dispersion where multiple modes arrived at the receiver with different time delays. This is known as differential mode delay or DMD. The faster the system, or longer the span, the more pronounced this effect becomes. Therefore, designers should anticipate whether high speeds or long distances would affect their system. If the answer is yes, then the logical solution is to use single-mode fibers which are not affected by DMD. For now, let's look at a typical single-mode span operating at 1310 nanometers and using the industry standard ITUT G.652 fiber. This fiber is the standard for telephone companies, utilities, ITS, and campus applications. In the past, most transmitters used the Fabry Poirot laser, but for shorter campus applications up to 10 kilometers, the use of the 1310 Vixel is now an option. In this case, we see an ITS, or Intelligent Transportation System, using a 10 kilometer span of G.652 conventional single mode fiber with splices placed at periodic city blocks and connectorized at each end. At 1310 nanometers, this fiber has an attenuation value of 0.35 dB per kilometer, giving us a 3.5 dB in fiber loss. The connector values are specified by the ITU G.671 standard as 0.5 dB each for a total of 1 dB. We also have 10 splices with an attenuation value specified by the TIA EIA 758 customer owned outside plant standard as 0.1 dB per splice. Of these splices, 8 are in line and 2 are for terminating the single mode pigtails on the end of each fiber. This adds up to 1 more dB. The sum of the fiber, connectors and splices now equals a not to exceed value of 5.5 dB. 
A typical laser transmitter would have a coupled power level of minus 5 dBm, and a matching receiver using a pin detector would have a sensitivity of minus 30 dBm, leaving 25 dB of allowed loss. This is far more than adequate for the expected span loss of 5.5 dB. Again, it is important to know the receiver's saturation point as well. At optical powers greater than the detector's maximum level, the detector is oversaturated with light, resulting in errors and data loss. In these cases, an optical attenuator would be required at the receiver to lower the optical power to an acceptable level. Another important issue is a recommended safety margin. Typically, designers allow 3 to 5 dB as a safety margin to address future attenuation changes. These could be degradation of optical power from the light sources, environmental stresses in the outside plant, and future changes including mid-entries. Future changes could also include technical updates, such as the inclusion of optical passive devices, including couplers, WDMs, or optical switches. These products are used in many DWDM, FTTX, and networks featuring reconfigurable optical add drop multiplexers known as Rotoms. Another key point is that over the life of the system, it is expected that there will be damage to the cable and restoration splices will be needed. Each of these will increase the attenuation level required in the future. It isn't uncommon to see safety margins of 5 to 10 dB in long haul systems due to these issues. When adding this amount to the 5.5 dB initially required, we see that our system will still operate with flexibility for future needs. If necessary, the choice of transmitter and receiver can be changed to allow the designer more room in the system margin. In all cases, the amount of light received at the photo detector must be strong enough to reconvert the optical signal to a facsimile of the original signal with high quality of signal and low bit error rate. Designers therefore have several options to ensure adequate link or system margin including the selection of a transmitter with a higher output power level. Another option would be to increase the optical sensitivity of the receiver by the selection of the type of photodiode in the receiver, such as an APD versus the pin type. Let's now look at a long haul application. Because we expect the fiber attenuation to be the major cause of attenuation, we will use the low loss G.655 non-zero dispersion shifted single mode fiber, which has the lowest attenuation when operating in the conventional or C band between 1530 to 1565 nanometers. Besides having attenuation values of 0.2 dB per kilometer, this fiber can also be used with erbium doped fiber amplifier or EDFA allowing for DWDM operation. In this case, DFB lasers will be used as they provide fast modulation, very high powers, and their narrow spectral width makes them ideal for high speed long haul and DWDM applications. Baseline products usually offer a pin photodiode for the lowest possible cost. However, if increased range is needed, as in this case, most manufacturers offer a variety of product options. The use of an avalanche photodiode provides greatly increased sensitivity. On average, you can expect a 10 dB increase in dynamic range in the form of increased receiver sensitivity through the use of an APD receiver. While APDs cost more than pin devices, they can often eliminate the need for costly repeaters. In this case, the span will be 120 km in length with each end terminated with low loss, low reflectance SC APC connectors with specified attenuation values of 0.5 dB each. The splices are placed every 6 km. The total fiber loss will be 24 dB, the connection loss is 1 dB, and the total splice loss will be 4 dB. The total of these losses is 29 dB. In this case, the safety margin will need to be 2 dB. The DFB transmitter has a power level of plus 1 dBm and the receiver has a minimum power level of minus 30 dBm with a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 12. This leaves us a total of 31 dB. In this case, an optical attenuator should not be required because the total loss is very close to the system gain. Another consideration would be for those who would incorporate optical switches in their network to reconfigure the optical system in case of failure or other requirements. In these cases, the designer must also consider the additional loss caused by the switch, related connection points, 
and the additional loss of the added fiber span. Today, fiber to the user installations are rapidly expanding. Most use the ITUT passive optical network standard, which incorporates optical splitters and a variety of classifications for power levels in both downstream and upstream transmission, using multiple wavelengths operating bidirectionally over the G.652 fiber. This adds complexity to the loss budget, primarily due to the added attenuation of the optical splitters and the use of bi-directional transmission at 1310 and 1550 nanometers. However, the ITU and IEEE standards identify the loss values and the various options. Other applications of bi-directional transmission over a single fiber include intelligent transportation systems, as well as industrial, commercial, and audio-video applications. Most multimode systems use the 1300 and 850 nanometer wavelengths. Single mode systems use 1310 and 1550 nanometer wavelengths over the same fiber. When calculating loss budgets for these bidirectional systems, it's important to consider the fiber attenuation of both of these wavelengths. In multimode video and data systems, 1300 nanometers is used for transmitting video, while 850 nanometers is used for transmitting camera control data. Single mode systems will use 1310 nanometers for video, while 1550 nanometers is used for the return data. Because of the large difference in fiber attenuation of the 1300 and 850 nanometer wavelengths in multimode fiber, it's important to consider the 850 nanometer wavelength when calculating the worst case fiber attenuation and thus the overall optical loss budget. You also need to consider any core mismatch losses that occur when linking different sections of 62.5125 Legacy and 5125 Laser Optimized Multimode Fibers. Again, because the transmission is bidirectional, the core mismatch must be considered for both directions of transmission. In single mode systems, the fiber attenuation difference between 1310 and 1550 nanometers is not as large as that in multimode systems. However, it must be taken into account when calculating the overall loss budget. If a system is designed for low loss 1550 nanometer transmission and a 1310 nanometer system is later considered, there may be too much loss for the span to operate at 1310 nanometers. Other factors that must be taken into account with bi-directional single mode systems include the type of laser used at 1550 nanometers, the data rate of the signal being transmitted, and the span length of the fiber. In many cases, a Fabry-Perot laser is used to minimize cost. However, high-speed systems using a 1550 nanometer Fabry-Perot laser will be limited in distance due to dispersion. The dispersion of standard G.652 single-mode fiber is 17 picoseconds per kilometer at 1550 nanometers, compared to 3.2 picoseconds at 1310 nanometers. This results in maximum distances typically between 5 and 10 kilometers depending on the data rate when using Fabry-Perot lasers at 1550 nanometers. In these cases, it will be necessary to specify the use of a DFB laser to prevent dispersion from becoming the limiting factor in fiber span length. From these examples, you can see how the operation of the various sources, detectors, fibers, and wavelengths are interrelated and that careful matching is needed to maximize performance for the intended fiber optic application.